Okay, guys, we are finally to our speech for our persuasive policy speech. So today we'll talk a little bit about the organization and thought process that should go into structuring your speech for. So we've kind of worked through going from a proposition of fact or value, just stating that there is a problem, and then describing that there's a need for change, outlining what might be a possible solution to the problem. And remember, it needs to be practical, something that actually can be implemented to solve the problem. And now we're going to turn that all around, structure it all together into our speech for supporting that proposition of policy, what should or needs to be done to, to address the problem. So here students will prepare, rehearse, and present a persuasive speech in support of a proposition of policy. The assignment is meant to challenge students to tackle and solve societal issues. In doing so, students may only be able to get the ball rolling toward a larger and more encompassing, encompassing solution. So here, guys, what that means is sometimes we as public speaking students, there is nothing that we can do uh, actually to solve the problem. But we know who can, and we might be able to address how they can do so or provide some insight and ideas into how they might be able to do so. So the proposition of policy, you want to advocate for a specific action, a changing of a policy, procedure, or behavior, and you may seek passive agreement, which is another word for third party agreement, or immediate action from the audience. And remembering that passive agreement is where that larger entity must end up solving the, the, the problem. So maybe the federal government, maybe the school district, maybe a certain board must make the decision. And really it's out of your hands, but you can tell us the process into um, implementing that solution and really it just comes down to them saying yay or nay and them taking action but you've taken all of the action and provided that detail um, up into that point. Or you have immediate action, which is where we as audience members actually can implement that change. So maybe you want us to recycle. Maybe you want us to become organ donors. Maybe you want us to donate money or time to a certain cause. Um, those kinds of things. So it's where we as, our, as public speaking students can actually, like right after the speech, go out and make that change. Sometimes, guys, you might actually be able to combine passive agreement and immediate action, which I'm okay with. So you might say, the government actually has to pass this law to solve this problem. But we as public speaking students right now can take action by writing our legislatures, by um, signing up to be voters, by calling up our representative, um, by signing this petition, something like that. So you have outlined the actual change that needs to take place at a higher level, but then you're also telling us what we can do to get that ball rolling and take that first step. So for example, students may try to persuade the audience that the federal government should provide more funding for, for public schools, or may persuade your audience to vote for a special tax to support public schools. So you see the difference there. You've done third party agreement by saying the federal government should provide more funding for schools and you're going to explain how and why. Or persuade us to vote for a special tax to support public, school, public schools there. Okay, see the difference? All right, so organization is the next big thing. We are doing a proposition of policy, literally saying in our proposition of policy what should or needs to change, and then we are going to organize using either problem solution or Monroe's motivated sequence. So here we are reorganizing, supporting that proposition of policy. The key with problem solution is that you only have two main points, knowing that those two main points are going to be pretty big, so lots of those subpoint levels. Um, the first main point advocating that there is a problem, and the second main point advocating for a solution to that problem and you might even break down the problem into two or three aspects and then provide solutions to those three aspects or you might have one solution that solves all of the problems just making that really clear in your language and another thing guys remembering that whenever you indent to a new uh, subpoint level you must always have at least two points to support that level so you'll never just have an a you'll never just have a one you have to always have an a and a b to support that break in the level. Otherwise, you should just be more concise and include it in the point above or add another level to be a bit more descriptive and detailed. Okay. 
with Monroe's motivated sequence, that is only with those immediate action speeches, what we can do right here, right now. It's like those infomercials where they're trying to get us to call the number and order the product that's going to make this huge difference in our lives, right? So going back to our lecture, our persuasive organization lecture, and looking at the best way to organize using Monroe's motivated sequence and looking back in our chapter readings as well. So this speech requires use of the methods of persuasion. So special, special emphasis should be given to evidence and reasoning. So remembering we don't really just want to be a machine gun of facts. We don't want to just state fact stat, fact stat over and over to uh, illustrate our problem and then solve the problem. We want to make that human connection and provide that supplemental material to really use both our ethos and our logos and our pathos. So all those three things need to come together. We don't want to focus too much on the logos too much on the facts. We have to position using some pathos and always have that credibility as the oomph behind our message, right? So, special emphasis given to evidence and reasoning. And I find, guys, if you are struggling where you've indented and you only have an A, having that extra sub point where you can add some positioning and some personal experience, some personal language, societal examples, if you don't have that personal experience, will really help to position that research and create that human connection. So here you need at least six credible sources to support your message, and your speech should demonstrate the concepts and principles of effective speaking discussed in your lecture and in your text. So the delivery portion of our rubric is quite a bit bigger here. Uh, you must turn in your typed preparation outline prior to speaking just like we've been doing and you have five and a half to nine minutes. So I would say you're shooting for probably six minutes to seven thirty minutes to give yourself kind of a wiggle room on either side of the time frame knowing that you will be deducted points if you're over or under and asked to stop speaking at nine minutes especially because nine minute speeches get a little bit long for all of us to be online for that big chunk of time. Okay guys, so talking about visual aids for speech four. Visual aids are not permitted for speech four, so you don't have to prepare them. We are not using them for speech four. We've kind of practiced how we use them, how we integrate them uh, with our speech three assignment, should you ever need them for other presentations, business presentations, those kinds of things moving forward. But here we're really gonna focus on delivery and that extemporaneous delivery where we're not memorized, but we're not read, and we're using our notes really well to just keep us on track and remind us of any delivery cues, any citations, um, any direct quotes, uh, just kind of keep our organization and our thought process on track as we go. So focused more on delivery here, we know how to use visual aids from speech three, not permitted in speech four. If you have questions on that, please let me know. And as always, you will have a critique of classmates due after this speech. So taking some notes, picking out one peer uh, to answer those 10 questions that we always have following our speaking assignments. And here I always provide you your rubric, guys. You can kind of go through and use this as a checklist, just as I'm going to do in assessing your speech. So looking, did I include my proposition of policy from the top of my outline actually in my intro paragraph? Did I preview all of my main points? Did I establish credibility, my speaking credibility, so my uh, credibility as the speaker to discuss the topic? which might be personal experience, it might be a passion for the subject, it might be personal experience and passion and that you've done some research. So making sure you're always establishing credibility um, there. So just going through making sure you've completed all of these things prior to speaking and then delivery, remembering all of these things um, as you go in to speak. And this is our final speech, so there is no example, but always referring back to previous examples for formatting and those kinds of things. Okay, guys, if you have questions at all, I'm always here to help, and I'm really excited to hear your speech fours, so uh, prepare well, and I'll see you soon.